Look, I want to start with one of your first big moves after you founded Cowboy, which was the founding, the coining of this term, startup unicorn, to refer to tech companies that had hit a billion dollar valuation within 10 years. It has since taken on a life of its own. Did you ever think it would become that big? <laughs> No, I definitely did not. I remember actually doing the analysis and then writing the blog post. And I was actually at a tech conference, the lobby conference, and flying back on the plane with some a bunch of friends in tech. And I, I showed the draft to a couple people. I'm like, what do you think? Is this interesting? And I think the guy next to me was like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it was definitely not a, this is going to be huge. This is a great name, way to go, kind of a moment. <laughs> Well, clearly it's been more than okay. And now there were 39 unicorns a decade ago when you wrote that. Now there are more than 500. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you? Well, uh, to be fair, the first analysis was just US, right? And the 500 number does include global, which is I think almost half of the list. So let's say it's 250 in the US, uh, like roughly versus 39. But yeah, I mean, obviously um, there's a lot of merit to the, the phrase, the. Andreessen coin phrase, software eating the world. I think just the markets are global. They are bigger than I think we would have guessed. And it's just accelerating sadly um, because of COVID, I think. So yeah, the markets for tech and the appetites and the opportunity it presents are amazing. So we'll talk about that in a sec, but because unicorns are now a little less rare, I wonder, do you think we need to move the goalpost at all? Like, should we be talking about 2 billion or 5 billion or, or 10 billion? No right. offense or to like the companies that are worth more than a billion dollars. Yeah. Like, what's the name for a trillion dollar company? Like, when, when I wrote, did the analysis, there were, were no trillion dollar tech companies, and now there's at least two. Uh, no, I think building a, I mean, building a billion dollar company is still very rare and very hard. Uh, so we can come up with other annoying terms for things that are even bigger than a billion dollars. But I still think, I mean, as a person who works with tiny startups, a lot of them, I know what a big milestone that is and how much work it is to get from one to 10 million in revenue and from 10 to 30 million in revenue and from 30 to $100 million in revenue. It's, it takes, it's a huge team effort. And even when you have the most incredible people and the most incredible ideas around the table, sometimes people don't make it even though they have the best of intentions. There are now four trillion dollar companies, Aileen. They're all tech oh companies, gosh. and we're going to talk about some of those later in the hour. Okay. Which okay. brings me to now that you are here, where are you placing your bets? Like, what do you think the unicorns of the next decade are going to be, whether it's specific companies or the sectors they will be in? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll use this opportunity to clarify. I think when I started Cowboy eight years ago, I think there was a belief that we would only invest in female founders, which we do love doing, or that we would only invest in consumer because I'm a woman. Therefore, I must only know about consumer things or only know about how to work with women. So we do invest, we're generalists, and we actually invest in a lot of enterprise software companies and infrastructure and security and developer tools in addition to consumer. And I think there is so much opportunity in both. Uh, that we are, you know, it's been a little, uh, we had some exciting consumer stuff going on about five or eight years ago, and then it's been a little dry. And uh, But I think there's a whole new wave in consumer coming up, which is very exciting. Uh, a couple of companies that we've invested in, like The Landing and The Newness, actually are early stage companies that launched last week. And we're very excited about new social, social with privacy and security built in from the beginning, new communities. Uh, and then in enterprise, there's just so much opportunity, especially I think in financial services, in learning education and healthcare. So those are areas that we're going to really lean into. So I think, unfortunately, uh, COVID has you know, caused so much suffering around the world, but it's really, I think, causing a lot of industries to embrace technology at a much, much faster pace than they would have otherwise. Now, it's interesting, and I'm sure interesting for you to look back on those interviews with Mike Moritz of Sequoia and <laughs> Alan Pau, who, who sued Kiner Perkins. I, I was like, my heart was beating. I was like, oh, God, she's going to ask me about it. Well, you know, here we are. Like when you left Cowboy, in, in, I mean, when you left Kleiner in 2012, that was a radical move. And that was the context, right? Women weren't doing this. Yeah. And I'm curious how I mean, you reflect was, on that decision now. It wasn't, I mean, I was reflecting on it a little bit because you're at your 10 year anniversary. I'm at my, almost at my eight year with Cowboy. And at the time, um, it, I was one of the only women to found a firm. Kirsten Green and I started around the same time. 
um, being a solo GP was a really big deal. There were a lot of LPs were like, you're a solo GP. How is that going to work? I don't know. I don't do that. Uh, explaining seed was a thing. Like, you know, I had, it was, a, there were very, there were, there were some great seed firms, but not a lot of them. So explaining this new category called seed, that was really an, like the kind of, it had moved from A being the first institutional round to seed. So a lot has really changed in the past eight years, but it was really, I love the job of working with early stage founders and I'm so grateful to have worked at Kleiner and worked with incredible people and learned a lot, but it just felt like a good time to kind of move earlier and kind of start over. And in retrospect, it's been a chance for me to actually build a much more um, personal business where I think hopefully we're building a firm where people can really be themselves. And um, I think maybe some of the things that I've done, like all raise, I might not have done if I was in a bigger shop where you're just more, more self-conscious about what you're saying and you feel like people are um, just paying a lot more attention. Speaking of all raise, according to your latest report, women make up 12% of VC decision makers. Women founded startups get 11% of funding. I know that's like slightly better than it was a few years mm -hmm. before that, but I assume you don't think those numbers are good enough. No, we have so far to go. You know, we've said from the beginning, this is gonna be at least a 10 year journey, if not longer, because moving the needle is really, moving the numbers takes a long time. Um, I'm hopeful because I think there's much more sensitivity now than there was a few years ago about this inequity. Um, and I'm really hopeful that the next generation of founders, when they're founding the company, instead of it just being the guy that you used to have lunch with at work or the guy that you lived with, that you'll think like, I wanna build the best possible company. So let me recruit a founding team and founding employees that represent all kinds of backgrounds so I can recruit all kinds of people and also have different voices around the table. So. I feel like we're making progress on that front. That's like culture is a leading indicator before numbers, but we have a long way to go. I sat down with Arlen Hamilton, another venture capitalist who's focused on investing in women, people of color, LGBTQ only. Um, take a listen to a, a clip of what she had to say. The thesis is, if they uh, are doing things with so little, what happens when we give them more? So I then took that and decided to invest in women, people of color, and LGBT founders. So what if you find the next Mark Zuckerberg and he doesn't fit into any of those categories? You just let him walk away? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> um, sorry, that's, that's actually funny. Um, <laughs> I have zero problem watching another Mark Zuckerberg walk away. Aileen, you know, still today we think of a tech visionary and so many people think of someone who looks like Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. What are we going to think when we think of a tech visionary a decade from now? Will the stereotype, will that image have changed? I think, I do think founders today are different. So uh, there's a really hot startup that's getting a ton of attention right now. And that the CEO, we had a conversation last week and he said, I don't want to build a company like people did 10 years ago. He's like, I want to build a company where I would love help making sure that I have people of color and women on my executive team, on my board, on my cap table, in my company from the beginning. Can you help me with that? Um, I think that's where the world is going. Uh, smart founders know that that's the best and healthiest way to build a resilient company. And we're seeing it with firms. I mean, yes, we have a long way to go, but I think firms realize like they pretended that there was no problems and they pretended that the problem was like pipeline for a long time. And I think they're realizing that their networks are pretty um, uh, homogenous and that by bringing in women and people of color to the partner ranks and to the managing partner ranks, they're gonna be able to attract and demonstrate to founders that they're gonna help them build healthy companies. So I'm hopeful that's changing and that the next set of so, Mark Zuckerbergs will be different. If the next set of Mark Zuckerbergs do get that yeah. chance. How do you think the tech industry will be different in a decade? Like if, if more women get a chance to, to found Facebook or, and people of color get a chance to, to found Google or the next Apple or the next Amazon, does the world change? Yes, completely. I think it will change a ton. I mean, I think when you look at the societal impact, both on people's daily lives, 
um, of these tech products that have on people's, but then also even look at the intergenerational wealth and societal impact created by people like Jeff Bezos or Mark Benioff or Michael Bloomberg. Imagine if women and people of color are at least half of those of that kind of wealth. Like what kind of projects will be funded? Well, and the, I think innately the products, the tech products that are built will be more equitable. Um, like people won't be bullied online as much. They won't, like women won't get treated like crap like they do in a lot of social environments, uh, digital ones, because they'll actually be part of building the products. Um, so I think it'll be better for everyone. And like, there'll just be more fairness. 100%. I'm not saying everyone's gonna be a billionaire, but it's gonna be better. 